a professor, uh, a professor sharing a combination of, of science, theory, but also practical ideas as well. Things you can actually think about, but also turn into practical action. Right now, it's uh, all about lessons identified to lessons learned, driving employee silence to employee voice. Again, intrigued to really hear what this is all about. Uh, so from University of York City College, Leslie T. Shanossi. Leslie, are you there? I'm here. Good to good to be with you. Um, you know, as as you were doing that introduction, um, I was thinking, oh boy, here comes the science, here comes the theory, and the only thing that came to mind was boring. Okay, so don't worry. We're gonna find that we're gonna find that uh, that practical application to everything. But it's a real pleasure to be here. Okay, over to you, Leslie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, again, uh, it's uh, it's fantastic to be here. Really uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk with you guys, to uh, to prepare, to to talk about moving from lessons identified to uh, to lessons learned. Um, let me just set up the uh, the presentation here. Just add them from here. Just putting them into the, the system now, and we should be ready to go. All right, as it's uh, as it's processing and uh, and coming up here, let's uh, let's begin just by uh, giving you a little bit of historical background behind lessons identified to lessons learned as the focal point here, and then we'll we'll go forward. Uh, lessons identified to lessons learned is sort of comes out of what we would normally call organizational learning. Okay, there is a whole body of literature res related to organizational learning. Uh, authors like Chris Ar Argiris is one of the, uh, if you will, the gurus related to uh, organizational learning. And it sort of, for lack of a better term, floated away. Um, and it just, we just sort of started assuming things in terms of organizational learning. And what got me back involved in this was actually some work that we were doing for uh, NATO, NATO Rapid Defense Corps. And um, what, we, what we found with a, a colleague of mine is that the, in a military type of setting, identifying lessons from activities that are happening is absolutely critical but what was even more critical was driving that to lessons learned. Why? Because you have issues related to life and death. Okay? You have issues related to survival and non-survival based on the lessons identified turning into lessons learned. And one of the things that we found is that employee silence versus employee voice was a big part of this. So that sort of brought these two areas together and that's what I want to, uh, to focus in on with you for, uh, for today. Uh, in terms of um, my, my presentation with you, I want to just start very, very briefly to talk about uh, employee silence and employee voice. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about how we learn the learning process and then creating a new type of learning system based on this drive from lessons learned sorry, from lessons identified to, uh, to lessons learned. When we talk about voice and voice channels within the HR profession, we talk a lot about these days about, for example, transparency of communication, okay? And, uh, you know, I, I, I've been, I do a lot of work throughout the region. I do a lot of work uh, talking with HR departments, with companies, then everybody, it's all about transparency. It's all about getting the getting people's ideas and so on. But there are some problems. And in fact, there are a lot of different problems related to employee voice and employee silence. So let's look at sort of the formal versus the informal sides of voice first. When you talk about the formal side, you talk about things like, uh, you know, everybody has an open door policy or you know the one-on-one -on -one meetings that we have with people sometimes it gets a little bit more formal into unions and so on those are all the formal voice mechanisms that we have in place 
But there are a lot of informal voice mechanisms, um, just pure word of mouth. Um, social media is a, as a formal way. Now, of course, Elon Musk will say, oh, no, 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 no. Social media is a formal voice mechanism because that's the way that I have to fire people. So we got, no, I'm just kidding. I'll leave Elon out of the, the equation for now. Um, open door policies, informal discussions, all of these ways through which we try to embed employee voice inside our uh, organizations. So the question then becomes, when do employees actually use their voice? Okay, When do they use their voice or how do they use their voice? Well, the conditions for this and when it's really um, important to get that voice out there is when we're aware of a particular problem or an opportunity or a, a suggestion and we want to get that out to somebody. Now, as soon as we say, I, there, you know, I have this idea or I have this problem that I want to overcome, what goes through the employee's mind is, what are the consequences of this? I'll give you a quick example. Um, the, uh, the CEO comes along or the CFO or the UFO, somebody inside the organization and says, we've got to save money, okay? And I'm, I'm on the lower levels of the organization. And I, I, let me be clear right at the very beginning here. For me, the people at the lowest levels of organizations are the most important people in our organization. So I'm on the front lines and I, I give my I, idea to my boss. And um, I, but I've got this idea on how to save money and I do a quick calculation and it shows that if I worked in a particular way, the organization could save, let me make up a number, 5,000 euros per year, okay? So I've got this great idea. My boss has said, give us some ideas on how to save money. And then I think about it and I say, geez, you know what? I, I've been here for three years. That means 5,000 euros per month saved, multiplied by 12 months, oh crap, that's 60,000. Two years, that's 120,000 euros this organization could have saved. I don't want my boss knowing this, okay? So then we move over to something called employee silence, okay? I basically swallow the idea. I've identified something, but I don't share the information with others. Okay, I, I, ref, I because of the consequences that comes to me. So we'll come back to employee silence in a second. So employee voice means that we, when we're voicing, we have a sense of obligation. We want to improve things. We want to help. Uh, we want to have the well-being of others. Let me talk about pre-COVID. Go back into the pre-COVID, and we talk about things like employee well-being, uh, mental well-being. Think about the number of people pre-COVID that would come to us and talk to us about their mental health, their, 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 the feeling of destruction that they have. Very, very few people would come out and say anything. Why? Employee silence. I don't want to expose myself. I don't want others to know that, and, and you know, are they going to kick me out of the organization? Um, or are they going to th uh, think different of me? You know, I'm a manager. And the last thing we want is a manager who has poor mental health. So I shut up about it. COVID comes along and suddenly the whole issue of employee well-being rises to the surface. Mental well-being. Excellent. We've now moved from employee voice, sorry, employee silence to employee voice. Why? because the context has changed. Um, other ways that we use our voice. Basically, we have this differentiation between a collectivistic culture versus an individualistic culture. Leadership style impacts employee voice. Um, empowerment gives us that opportunity to play with employee voice. So there's a very specific connection between lessons identified, lessons learned, and voice but also silence aspect of things, the holding on to ideas. And again, I go back to military and then I want to bring it forward. In military, we talk about life and death. We talk about survival and non-survival. Then you start, people say, yeah, but come on, it's an organization. What are we talking about? Survival, not survival. 
Well, you know what? The difference is today between 5,000 euros a month saved versus 5,000 euros a month simply thrown away could be a matter of survival. Could it be that we're not speaking about things and having a, a negative impact on mental health, physical health, all of these things that fortunately COVID has risen to the surface. Now's that opportunity to start breaking the silence and getting to voice, especially as it relates to lessons learned and lessons identified. So there are basically three forms of silence that we have. One is what we call defensive silence. And this is basically where we conceal information. We hide information. Um, and, you know, these are things that, you know, quite honestly, I got to say, you know, myself as well, I do it as well. Okay, I'm not, you know, just because I'm in this chair and the academic side doesn't mean that I don't have information that I don't share with others. I try to protect myself or I try to protect others at work. You know, I, I want to maintain good working relationships. So I, def I, I don't say certain things that could potentially move from a lesson identified to a lesson learned simply because I don't want to expose anybody. It could be because history has taught me that no matter what it is that I say, nobody's listening. Okay, I share information and it's pointless. It's what we call acquiescent silence. Here, um, some of you may be familiar with something called locus of control. And there are two types of locuses of control. One's called an internal locus of control. The other is an external locus of control. Internal locus of control says, my actions impact others. What I do has an impact. External says, it doesn't matter what I do. I can speak, I could shout to the ceiling, but people won't listen or nothing will happen. So we want to move away from having this external locus of control. And that's why all of this work that we, that we move towards transparency. Transparency is a beautiful, beautiful term. I love the word transparent. I, it means I can see through. I have this big, much bigger, wider arena within which to communicate and to, and to link towards um, towards people-centric learning. The problem is what is transparent is actually opaque. We've got to get to an internal locus of control. The final type of silence is basically where we hold things back. I, I like the status quo, okay? I like the fact that, you know, we come and go as we wish inside the office, even though I know that it could be better or we could do things in a more effective way. I like that flexibility. Think about these days, the fact that we have that great resignation that everybody keeps talking about. You've got this approximately 20 to 30% that say, I want back to the office. You've got about 20 to 30% that say, I don't want to see the office again a day in my life. And then you have this 40 to 60% that say they want both. Okay. The status quo was, I've got to be clear here, was everybody comes to work. Yes, I know in some organizations you were in hybrid mode, absolutely fair enough, but the status quo truly was that. Or if you were in a hybrid type of mode, if you wanted to be promoted or if you wanted to become a manager, they tended to be much more at the office than they were in a hybrid type of mode. So we have this, what we call pro-social silence, which is basically holding things back, trying to keep the status quo. So employee voice, employee silence, link to lessons identified to lessons learned. How do we go forward from it? Let's try and make this as practical as possible. Well, here's the thing. Learning and the process of learning is actually change driven. I've done a couple of uh, seminars for uh, within the uh, within the HR association or the HR week related to change, but learning has to be a relatively permanent change in either knowledge or behavior. And with learning comes change. I've identified something. I've got this lesson identified. 
how do I make the change or how, not how do I make the change, how do we make the change so that we don't make the same mistake. But this learning takes place through practice and through experience, but by definition, it comes through employee voice. If nobody has said anything, if I hold held it down, I have I want to maintain the status quo. I've got defensive silence or acquiescent silence or pro-social science. Nothing changes. No learning occurs. So what do we say here? Don't assume anything in relation to learn lessons identified and lessons learned. Don't assume you're going to make an ass out of you and me in this process. We have to work towards creating the environment of lessons identified. Let me give you a very quick way, a very quick way of trying to tease out those lessons identified and moving them towards lessons learned. In our organizations, we absolutely adore KPIs. Okay, KPIs, it's all about KPIs. You want to, you want to move from lessons identified to lessons learned. Make it a KPI. Make a KPI related to identifying lessons and turning those into lessons learned and give credit to the voice, whoever came up with the idea. That's how you move off of this transparent way of approaching things. Sorry, this uh, translucent to transparent. If it's not, unfortunately, and again, don't get me wrong, I hate KPIs, but I know that they're a necessary evil. Use KPIs as a way, if you believe that you need to move for, from silence to voice, if you truly believe that you need to work, move from lessons identified to lessons learned. And we're not just talking about insider office, we're talking within our organization, across the multinational channels and so on. There is so there's so many lessons that we've identified that have never turned into a lesson learned that could preserve us, that could avoid unpleasant situations, that could avoid death, that could avoid health issues. And most importantly, not most importantly, that's that's that, that that was bad wording. Could save us money or make us money. Okay. There are so many different opportunities out there. So what's holding us back? Okay. We want this driving. We want to unfreeze the status quo in learning. We want to move towards the transparency. What is keeping us down? Is it our managers? Maybe. Is it the informal and formal voice mechanisms that we have inside of our organizations? Perhaps. Or maybe, just maybe, it's the fact that we're not promoting the lessons identified to lessons learned and the positive impact that it can have on our organizations. This is where I'll talk to each of us in HR. And there is a beautiful body of literature. And it's not just literature, because as soon as I say literature, people turn off. They go, okay, here goes the academic again. He's going to bore me to death about something. It's called internal marketing. One of the best ways, most effective ways to add value from an HR point of view is in what we call internal marketing. It's got to do with the promotion and the marketing of positive things that we do. And one of those is moving from lessons identified to lessons learned, how it impacts people's work, how it impacts their career, how it impacts positive outcomes inside of the organization. Maybe crazy enough, it actually impacts positively people's KPIs. Why? Because when we have lessons identified to lessons learned, it means that I won't make the same mistakes as some of my colleagues in another region. It means that we're sharing internally best practices. And a lot of best practices happen inside our organizations. As well, there are okay bad practices that also occur that we should learn from when we're, when we're talking to clients, when we're on the operations floor, when we're in the IT department, whatever it is, and try to bring those to the surface. So how do you motivate learning? 
how do you motivate identif lessons identified to lessons learned? Well, a guy by the name of Blinder was the head of a, um, well, a little consumer goods company called Unilever. A little baby multinational does you know, a couple to 10 billion, 20 billion dollars business here and there. He says only imminent death will get things moving. Okay. Pretty grim way of approaching the learning or the change process. But here's the thing. You've probably, uh, not probably, over a number of years, you've had a number of people come through this conference turning about, talking about neuroscience and the neuro aspect. Here, let me integrate some of that into motivating learning. As we know, the brain has two sides to it, the emotional side and the rational side. From a learning perspective, we have to, we have to look at it from those two sides. What is the intellectual reason for moving to a lessons identified? And what's the emotional side? Intellectually, I know that I should present certain bits of information. I should, I should identify for others so that they don't make the same mistake. But emotionally, I don't want to expose somebody. I don't want to look like what we call, uh, the, the Americans call, we sort of see that a little bit in Europe, a well, whistleblower, okay? The whistleblower, the person who identifies these things without recourse, that's the US experience. Whistleblowers are protected. When they call out an organization by law, they cannot be fired, okay? Because, I'm, because we want whistleblowing. Well, why should I hold on to information? You've got to target the emotional side and the intellectual side. I go back to my, uh, my example earlier. The money that we could save if I, if I put this lesson out there for others to learn from. Intellectually, I know I should put it out there. Emotionally, I don't want to get um, harmed by it. So from an HR perspective, what we have to do is we have to identify and understand that we have to move with both the emotional side and the rational side of things. When we see what, why do we resist learning? Well, it could be values, it could be traditions, uh, loss of face, could be age, okay? I am um, four years, three months, uh, three weeks, two days and six hours from retirement. I don't need to learn anything more. I, I've got my learnings up to here, whatever I learned from this point, I don't want to have to go through the hassles associated with it. Perhaps it's fear. Perhaps it's a low tolerance for learning, whatever it is. We've got to try and break through that. Arguably, success leads to a learning problem, which is a very odd way of approaching it. But think about it for a second. If you have been successful for an extended period of time, what happens is you become a little bit arrogant. Yeah, I know what it all means. Um, you become a little bit more internally focused. Um, you become a little bit more conservative. And what this leads is to less of speed, loss of innovation, loss of focus, and a decline in performance. Now, decline in performance doesn't mean that we have to go negative. It simply means that we're increasing at a decreasing rate. You've got to break that habit. We've got to and learning is a positive. Learning drives us forward. Learning should not be seen as something that's holding us back. There is always something to be learned. That's why a KPI associated with learning, not training and development, okay? That's something that we can control. I mean learning that comes from the floor that comes from the different levels inside the organization. That's where we want to identify those lessons. We did some research recently with uh, Generation Zs. And what Zs told us is as much as they appreciate training and development opportunities, they find that lessons learned on the job, development that comes from the job is more important than training and development. Let's leverage that. 
that, you know, this is what the data says. Zeds want this. Millennials also show a tendency towards it. Let's start driving learning through that rather than simply just the training and development side or what let's just call it traditional training and development. But I digress because we I know that we have some days here in the conference related to training and development. Let's get back on the people centric learning aspect train of this. Let me give you some guidelines in terms of managing learning and learning process. Whoever's involved has to be visible and committed. We also have to commit to ensure that people's intellectual side and their emotional sides are being taken care of. We have to have this effort connected to other parts of the organization, holistic. You don't want learning simply controlled lessons identified to lessons learned in a little part. Let me see if I can get it on the screen here. A little part of the organization. Let everybody know about it. Let me give credit here to NATO, NATO, uh, NATO forces. They have an entire website, an entire division dedicated to lessons identified, to lessons learned, and seeing how that can be disseminated internal marketing and creating a platform where everybody can learn from the mistakes that have been made but also the good things that have happened don't just look don't just wait for damage to happen for us to learn having said that when we fail it's an amazing learning opportunity it's an amazing learning opportunity it shouldn't be a punishment approach. If you want transparency, you've got to start looking at problem areas and identify those as learning opportunities as opposed to a punishment area. Um, diagnosis is critical and consistency also critical. Most importantly, and I just want to highlight this one, the most important part is the direct line manager. That's where learning has to be driven from. That's where, if you will, those KPIs need to be there in terms of moving from a lesson learned to a le lessons identified to lessons learned. Evaluating those lessons learned, determining what are the outcomes of this? What, what will be the money saved, the money generated, the lives saved, the lives lost, whatever it is from those learning opportunities. And again, What's that relationship between the effort, the missions, and the goals of the, uh, of the organizations themselves? Let me show you what people in this area say in terms of making change and learning successful. If you want to do this, this is what the key people, key managers who do this globally have said from 500 global companies. I want to just focus on the top three and the bottom one. You got to have the top involved, okay? And the top has to show the way in terms of lessons identified to lessons learned. Get people involved. Employees are, and again, we can use all those fancy, fancy HR terms. Our employees are our cultural carriers. Uh, without people, we are nothing. Well, yeah, guess what? Get them involved in the learning process. Really show them that the learning that occurs is from them and how it impacts the organization. Last one, I just want to point out internal champions. You've got to have internal learning champions. Now, I am not going to suggest that you have a chief learning officer. Okay, please. I refuse to go there. Um, I'm more than cynical about all of these new chief and then you fill in the blanks. Chief, chief of it. Everybody's a chief all of a sudden. Too many chiefs, not enough non-chiefs inside our organizations. But you need to have internal champions. You need to have internal learning champions that are there promoting it, um, getting the word out, um, making sure that people move from voice to silence inside our organizations. Whenever I do seminars, whenever I do these types of discussions, one of the things is always takeaways. Okay, we need to have takeaways. What can I take away? Okay, thank you very much, Samozi. You've just shown me 15 slides of information 
blah, 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 summarize it for me. Well, what I found is that people like things summarized in nice, simple things. So this is about as simple as I can do it. I call this Picasso, okay? Got to have something that's memorable as well, something you'll remember, well, let's just say an hour from now. How do we manage our chances of learning success? Okay, well, here's my Picasso model. Preparation. Preparation of the lessons identified to the lessons learned. You've got to have a system in place. You've got to have a framework in place. This is one area that I truly believe HR can add value. This is something that HR can show and demonstrate an internal market inside the organizations. And we can get away from that perspective that HR needs to do things. I see you back on screen. I promise I'm going to finish up. <laughs> you got time. Involve, it's okay. Involvement. Okay. Got to involve people as much as possible. Stakeholders. Employees are the key stakeholders here. Communicate the lessons identified to the lessons learned. Okay. Let people know about it. Internal market it. Have an approach to get things done. Have a strategy. You know, we, we do a lot of HR strategic planning, have a learning strategy, not just a training and development, training, development, and learning strategy. Once you got that motion, sustain it. Reward, okay? And I, again, rewards, I don't mean, you know, payments. I mean, find a way to let people know, feel good about identifying a lesson that others can learn from. And finally, be open to change the lessons learned. Today's lesson identified and then learned might not work tomorrow. So you have to be iterative about this process. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to present to you. Uh, I know it's a relatively short period of time that we have together, but I wanted to try and hit some highlights and I turn it back to our esteemed moderator. <laughs> Listen, I, I love the idea about too many chiefs. You're right. There are far too many chief this, chief that. We need those internal um, human heroes, naturally. Right, we've got a couple of questions coming through. We'll go through these very, very quickly. Josipa, thank you. You say, uh, you mentioned that you should use KPIs. Can you name or define a few KPIs that would be relevant for this use case scenario? Absolutely, absolutely. It would be my pleasure. Um, I've worked with a couple of companies in identifying this. And one of the things that we did was we said, on a quarterly basis, not on a yearly basis, on a quarterly basis, when you ask a manager to identify two lessons identified and how he or she would move it to a lesson learned. So of course, we want it on an iterative answer, but here's the logic behind it. There are always lessons that can be there. So let's start trying to pull them out. There's two ways of doing it. One is a push strategy, one's a pull strategy. KPIs, for, my, for myself anyway, are a beautiful pull strategy. Make, get it part of our regular vocabulary. That get it, you know, it's not just about sales, it's not just about output, it's not just about productivity. It's about if you truly believe, and again, you gotta be a believer on this one, if you truly believe that lessons identified are what we need and moving them to lessons learned, that's one of the ways to approach it. So quantify it. Uh, another one coming through. Um, is it better to have one on one sessions or to give generic questionnaires to, to engage employees? What would you say? Oh, boy. Um, they're very okay. different, though, very different scenarios. And, and they, they're both yeah. of them do very different things, right? Absolutely. And, you know, that's where the academic in me says both, okay, because we, you know, we try to cover our asses, right? I mean, say both, then <laughs> nobody will get, nobody, somebody will be, well, but I'm down, right down the middle. Safe, safe. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll, I will go out on a limb and I'll let people criticize me. For me, engagement is one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Um, I, as much as I appreciate engagement surveys that we do, okay, and I understand that, yes, making it a part of 360, can be a one way of approaching it. But at the end of the day, engagement is between you and me, okay? It, it, you know, if we can't engage this way, uh, now it doesn't have to be one-on-one, -on -one. it could be one-on group, okay? You can have group engagement as well. But I don't think you can um, discount the impact of face-to-face -face engagement. 
Um, I am not, okay, I understand the whole Zoom world that we're in, absolutely. But if you notice, HR people, that engagement level actually went down during Zoom, okay? You know, uh, magically, and microphone disappeared during Zooms, right? Why? We're engaging. Right now, I'm trying to engage with you, and my camera doesn't work. And then suddenly, somebody says, well, we need your camera in order to take a picture. And magically, my camera works again. We, there was some change in the way that we started engaging with people with Zoom. So face-to-face, one-on-one, yes. If you are going to engage through technology, I believe it has to be in this type of environment, one-on-one, -on -one, not one-on hundreds. It just is not as effective. Listen, and with that, Leslie, we, we're going to wrap up this this uh, session now. We've we've certainly um, absorbed and, and heard these lessons learned, your perspective, and and I'm sure it's, it's helped a lot of people to to kind of maybe rethink what they're doing, so that may, maybe just maybe they can do, maybe do things slightly different, different mindset, and get get closer to the outcomes they want. Already, already, I can see coming through on on the chat, Billy and a very interesting perspective. Um, Susanna says, thank you so much for an interesting inspirational and enthusiastic speech. There you go. How does that make you feel? Feel good? That makes me feel good. And now I've got a lesson identified and I'll turn that into a lesson learned. Thank you very much. You got it's it. been a real pleasure Wonderful. to be with everybody. Enjoy the rest Cheerio, of the Cheerio, Leslie. All the best. Bye-bye.